For those of you not familiar with how this virtual format works, you'll still be able to ask a question of the author if you'd like. To do so, just click on the, the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screens. The chat function also will be active. And in that column, you'll find a link for purchasing a copy of this evening's featured book, His Very Best by Jonathan Alter. Jonathan is an accomplished journalist, author, and documentary filmmaker. For nearly three decades, he was synonymous with Newsweek, where he was a senior editor, media critic, and columnist. And over the past 24 years, he's become a familiar face on NBC News and MSNBC, offering analysis. More recently, he's ventured into documentaries, winning an Emmy this year for the HBO film about two celebrated newspapermen, Jimmy Breslin and Pete Hamill. In addition, Jonathan has established himself as a best-selling author, writing acclaimed books on Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Barack Obama. In his new book, Jonathan provides the first full-length independent biography of Jimmy Carter. That it's taken this long for a full biography may sound somewhat surprising, given that Carter was president more than 40 years ago, and in the decades since, has succeeded in reinventing himself as a prominent activist promoting peace and seeking to alleviate human suffering. But Carter's one-term presidency still has tended to be given short shrift by many as a time of frustrating missteps and missed opportunities. Marshalling an extensive amount of research, Jonathan makes a convincing case to the contrary. He argues that Carter's record has been sorely under underrated and misunderstood and that the image of the 39th president as inept and weak is just plain misrepresentative of the man and his record. Now, Jonathan is no apologist for Carter and doesn't go easy on the former president's shortcomings or failures, but he does provide a, a much more rounded and nuanced view of Carter, rendering his subject, as a New York Times reviewer said, with a depth rarely achieved by political journalism. In conversation with Jonathan this evening will be Walter Isaacson, now a history professor at Tulane and someone who himself knows a thing or two about biography, having written first-rate works about Henry Kissinger, Ben Franklin, Albert Einstein, Steve Jobs, and most recently, Leonardo da Vinci. Now that, of course, is only part of Walter's very impressive resume, which also includes stints as managing editor of Time Magazine, chairman and CEO of CNN, and president and CEO of the Aspen Institute. And we here at PNP are always grateful when Walter agrees to moderate an author talk because he's so good at that too. So Jonathan and Walter, the screen is yours. Hey Bradley, thank you so much for having us again. And thanks for reminding everybody that Jonathan was some uh, sort of symbolic of Newsweek because as my many years at Time Magazine, we spent Monday morning saying, how come Jonathan Alter got that at Newsweek? <laughs> So it's great to uh, be with them again. And I want to start talking about something that touches on the current situation, which is, Jonathan, all of your books, Franklin Roosevelt, Barack Obama, and now Jimmy Carter, deal with the influence of character on the presidency. So why then is this book uh, particularly suited for this past four years, and maybe I should say also this past week? Well, first of all, I really want to thank Bradley and Lissa uh, for doing this. Uh, I think everybody watching knows that Politics and Prose is one of the truly great bookstores anywhere in the world. Uh, and so thank you. And thank you, Walter, for agreeing to, uh, to interview me about it. Um, so, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I started the book uh, in 2015 and uh, our late editor, Walter's editor, my editor at Simon & Schuster, Alice Mayhew uh, was Jimmy Carter's editor on several of his books. Uh, and so she kind of helped smooth the way and she was very interested in my uh, doing this. And then when I saw Carter at a book club uh, event in New York talking about Lawrence Wright's book about uh, uh, Camp David, um, you know, I realized there's got to be more to this guy than, uh, you know, inept president, great ex-president. That's just too simplistic because Camp David was a virtuoso performance. You know, it's the most enduring and important peace treaty 
since the end of World War II. It was negotiated by him personally. It almost fell apart on four or five occasions. He had to go to the Middle East six months later and put the whole thing back together with chewing gum and bailing wire. You know, so I figured if this thing was, you know, that great, there, there has to be more to him. And I had actually worked as an intern in his speechwriting office in the summer of 1978, but then I had been for Ted Kennedy, which is one of the dumb things that I did after, you know, after uh, Kennedy started his challenge, I was, I was for Kennedy. So even I, like at the time, really misunderstood his presidency. So in 2015, I, I set to work on Carter and I was just about a month into my research and I was at the Carter Library and um, I got a text from MSNBC, uh, get over to the studio in Atlanta. Uh, Donald Trump just came down the escalator and you know we want you to analyze Trump. So I went over and did that and um, then I went back to the library and I just felt like on that day and for all the days that have followed, that reading the Carter papers, immersing myself in Carter, it's like the papers, you know, they brushed away the toxins of Trump. And, and he became, for me, a, almost an escape uh, from, from what we were all living through and, and an example of how we really can have a smart, decent, accountable, honest, president and that maybe learning about him and re I hope reading about him can help light our way to a, a better a future. Uh, and so, and that's, that really helped keep me focused because as, you know, as I think people know, presidential biographies are really hard. You're talking about millions of papers and you have to develop a, a kind of a, um, an obsession, uh, in order to uh, get it done. Um, and I, I did over a five-year period, even though I was during the Jimmy Breslin and another Jimmy project, you know, um, but I, I really did become kind of obsessed. And, you know, instead of having Donald Trump squatting in my brain, I got to have Jimmy Carter for all of his flaws, who is this enormously complicated guy. So to me, like, I, I think Stephen Colbert is right about Trump, that he's fundamentally boring. There's not anything really there to figure out about it. And Carter is the un-Trump in so many ways, but he's also just so layered and complex and hard to figure out. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of him not resembling um, Trump, at one point I did a number of interviews in person with both Jimmy and Rosalind Carter. I built a house with them at Memphis for Habitat. I went back to the Naval Academy. But toward the end of the process, I was in touch with him mostly by email. And I would send him checking questions. I'd send him like 10 checking questions. I'd go out for a walk, I'd come back. They were all answered like within an hour. And one day um, after Trump became president, I, I said, you know, you were an outsider, President Trump outsider do you have anything in common with Donald Trump? And when I got back from my walk, I had a one word answer. No. <laughs> no, no, exactly. In, in some ways, Jimmy Carter was the antidote to the era of Nixon. Right. And in um, perhaps in a similar way, Joe Biden is the antidote to the era of Trump. Do you see it that way? Yeah, I think there are a lot of similarities there. Uh, um, even though, you know, more recently, like Biden has been like Reagan unseating a, an incumbent, and, you know, an, an older uh, uh, challenger. But, but the 76 campaign, when Carter went from 0% in the polls to the presidency, was really a product of Watergate. And I argue that he was both made and unmade by Watergate, that he never would have become president without you know, the, the moral power that worked so well with who he really was. And when he said, after Watergate, I'll never lie to you. We need a government as good as its people. And he actually did, in his stump speech, use that word healing that you hear from, from Joe Biden. Um, and then he was unmade by Watergate because the, in, in part, and you know, he had big problems in the economy, Iran hostages, not coming home, 
a lot of Ted Kennedy's challenge, mistakes he made, but he did have a really rough press. I mean, uh, Jody Powell said, you know, we not only didn't get a honeymoon, we didn't get a one night stand. And he was basically right about that uh, because from the moment Carter uh, pardoned draft dodgers on the first day of his presidency, it, you know, he was, he was getting hit basically every day. And the Washington press corps um, was, they like to affix gate to everything. And they kind of assumed president, we've had, you know, Johnson and Nixon and, you know, Ford wasn't crooked, but he was sort of part of Nixon. These guys are, they all have scandals. They're all scummy in one way or another. And Carter, you know, exaggerated. He, he would do political things. He could be sometimes petty. You know, I'm not painting him out to be, as, as Brad said, a saint, but he was genuinely moral person. And also, and this blew me away as a contrast to today, the accountability was amazing. So like when Dan, you know, Trump gave himself A plus, A plus and everything. When Dan Rather asked Carter on the eve of the Democratic Convention in 1980, what grades would you give yourself? Carter said, well, I guess a C plus on this and a B minus on that. Maybe a, maybe give me a B on that other thing, you know, that other area. And he just was, and it got him in trouble a lot of the times. He, he, he was pretty relentlessly honest. And that was reflected in policy. He got a tremendous number of bills through, more than either Obama or Clinton, because he, in part because he had a Democratic Congress for four years and they only had for two. But just to give you one of many examples we can talk about that relate to this morality, the Ethics and Government Act of 1978, the Inspector General's Act of 1978, they created whistleblower protections and offices of Inspector General. And there would have been no impeachment without those Carter era uh, laws. You talk about uh, him giving himself a C plus or a C minus on things. And you say it's honesty, but it also seems to be a bit of humility, uh, a trait that he certainly uh, distinguishes him from Donald Trump. <laughs> what was the basis of that humility? Was it his religious faith? Well, first of all, he wasn't always humble. Uh, I don't think any politician can genuinely be, be described as humble. And there were often what they call humble brags that would be part of his presentation. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the humility uh, did come from understanding the sin of pride and what that meant. And that was also connected, interestingly, to the, uh, you know, Lust in My Heart episode of the Playboy interview, which almost cost him uh, his election in 1976. It was just a couple months before the election. He went way down in the polls. Hard to believe nowadays that you could go down close to 10 points. Access Hollywood versus the Playboy interview. Yeah, right. um, but um, so I do think that a lot of it was faith related. Uh, you know, he prayed sometimes as often as 30 times a day. Uh, he'd say prayers in Spanish with Rosalind at night. Uh, um, he, uh, in 1968, uh, after he'd lost the first time for a governor, he went door to door in Massachusetts and Pennsylvania for uh, Jesus. And he, um, at one point they came upon a, a brothel and he tried to convert the madam. Um, didn't, didn't work, but, you know, but he wasn't like, he was um, pious without being publicly uh, judgmental. Like he, he was, his, his aides were some of the most sinning people who've ever been in public life. And he never judged them, very tolerant, eventually broke with the Southern Baptist Convention over their treatment of women and, uh, you know, was a, a different kind of evangelical Christian, to put it mildly. You know, you talk about his journey from being a barefoot boy to a global icon as being an American epic. And the book makes it feel that way. But I always, I like Jimmy Carter. I never, you know, turned against him. Uh, like you said, you did for a little while when you were younger. But I always thought of him as a little bit smaller than life rather than larger than life. Yeah, well, what happened to him, it's interesting. Um, so clearly in the presidency, he made himself smaller than life. Um, you know, he de the presidency. 
Uh, he got rid of the yacht Sequoia, which was a really dumb thing to do because that was a great way to butter up congressmen and, and uh, senators. And he uh, stopped playing Hail to the Chief for a while until Jerry Rafshoon and Rosalind started playing it again without asking him, you know, because he did kind of shrink himself. And it started out as, as a political thing where he would carry his own bags in the 76 campaign. And even when the Secret Service would carry his bags, when he got Secret Service protection, he'd still like have the, you know, have the, the garment bag so that he looked like a, a, a regular guy. And so in that sense, he shrunk himself. And he certainly does not have that thing where, you know, you, he walks in the room like Bill Clinton or Ronald Reagan or Trump, you know, and they, they command everybody. Everybody's eyes move toward them. He, he never had that. But he was extremely effective as a retail campaigner. He was just bad on television. He wasn't mm -hmm. a great speaker on television, to put it mildly. Uh, but in terms of, you know, one-to-one -one retail campaigning, a lot of people said they never saw anybody as good as he was, even though he didn't do that whole rope line thing that, that Joe Biden and other people did before, before COVID. He wasn't an expert at that, but he, he knew how to, so in Iowa, where he came out of nowhere to basically invent the Iowa caucuses, he'd start to develop these little things like he'd always arrive early. Most politicians, especially Clinton, get there late, you know, and people wait for them, but they're a little bit annoyed, like, where is he? And with Carter, he'd arrive early and he'd greet everybody as they walked into the room. Wow. And then he would have shaken hands with everybody. And then the word would spread around there. He's here, he's already here. You know? And immediately, right off the bat, he, he, he had something going. And then when he didn't know the answer to the question, he would admit it and people go, this is mind blowing. Or he became good friends with all these musicians. And one of the reasons that I put the Andy Warhol of Carter on the, on the cover is that there was a time when he, he might not have been larger than life, but he was very cool. And Hunter Thompson wanted him to be president, convinced all these reporters he should be president because of this speech that Hunter heard when he wasn't, you know, like he was going, there was Ted Kennedy and other people were giving boring speeches and Hunter would go to the car to refresh his iced tea with wild turkey and you know go back into these boring speeches. And then Carter gets up and he starts blasting the lawyers in the room and saying that, the criminal justice system is a disgrace in Georgia. This is when he's governor, and and you know, quoting Bob Dylan lyrics, and and uh, uh, Hunter Thompson goes back out, gets his tape recorder this time, and he has this tape of this 1974 speech that I argue had a lot to do with making uh, Jimmy Carter president. But then, just on this retail campaigning thing for a minute, so when he do these rock concerts, that, where he was friends with this rock promoter. And he had the Allman Brothers, Charlie Daniels, all these bands. And the, the ticket price, part of it would go for the Carter campaign. But the really cool thing he'd do is he'd stand up at the beginning of the rock concert and he would say, I just want to tell you three things. My name is Jimmy Carter and I'm running for president. I want your support, ladies and gentlemen, the Allman Brothers. And yeah. like everybody there was, my God, he's a politician who didn't make a speech. I'm for him, you know? And there's a new documentary out that's that's coming out on CNN next year where all of them, Dylan, uh, uh, all of these musicians, plus several who, who worked with them on Habitat sites, they all are kind of in awe of him. Johnny Cash loved him. Uh, so we, our impression of Carter, which is conditioned by his thrashing by Reagan, is not really uh, borne out by the Carter of of 1976. And in terms of his life, the reason I called it an American epic is, I mean, it is a novelistic life. And I, I, I make the argument that he's the only president who essentially lived in three centuries. You know, his child, he was born in 1924, but it might as well have been the 19th century. He, he was 11 years old when they got indoor plumbing. And, and, uh, and then, you know, obviously he was part of all the major movements of the 20th century recently very important in, in uh, women's rights globally. You know, his, his book on that and his advocacy on that has been very important. And then many of the issues that, uh, that uh, um, you know, are important in the 21st century from dispute resolution to global health, to democracy promotion, the Carter Center is on the cutting edge of all of those 
uh, issues. The women's issue part of it is um, really fascinated me, Walter, because um, so, you know, he met Rosalind when Rosalind was three days old. And I love uh, the fact that you say very few of us can say that we've known our spouses for more than 90 years. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but she is a hugely formidable woman and she reinvented the role of first lady, did much more than say Eleanor Roosevelt did, not just by sitting in on cabinet meetings, but by being a really important diplomat and advisor. And she and, shared with you for the first time the love letters, right? Yeah. And the yeah. portion of her diary from the Navy years? Yes. Uh, well, uh, she shared her diaries, uh, unpublished diaries from uh, Camp David, from the hostage rescue yeah. portion. And then in the Navy years, she gave me, and this was really, I was really excited when this happened because she gave me these quite steamy letters that not only had never been published, but that people who were very close to the Carters never knew existed. And yeah, they, uh, it ain't John and Abigail Adams. I mean, these are without question the steamiest letters between a president and first lady. Lost in his art. Yes, yes, <laughs> not on the page. He was <laughs> also a bit of a Renaissance man, you know, like a Ben Franklin. He, he was, so he wasn't a... I don't think he was a Franklin level genius, but uh, he- no. Neither was Franklin, don't worry. Well, but you know, having read your book, I mean, Franklin had him beat on that, but he was g genuinely a Renaissance man, is genuinely a Renaissance man. If, if you look at the range of his competencies, there used to be a word that was more often used in the mid 20th century, and it was a high compliment. And the word is able. He's an enormously able man, which is why the kind of image of him as being this incompetent guy. So, I mean, he, you know, he wrote a novel, he wrote a children's book, he wrote a book of poetry. He's a master woodworker. He's an expert on arrowheads, you know, he-, he But also nuclear energy. I mean, we're talking science as well. Yes, I mean, so this is an example of where he sometimes, he, he could be a little bit of a bullshitter, even though he wasn't a liar, isn't a liar. So he, he got in some trouble by saying that he was a nuclear physicist. But then it came out that, that when he really should be described as a nuclear engineer, because people who had PhDs, uh, you know, uh, said, well, you should have a PhD to describe yourself as a nuclear physicist. But he was doing nuclear physics in developing the first nuclear submarine. So he ran in, that was a pretty brave scene where he runs into a yeah, nuclear a meltdown reactor. So just on the, so a couple of points on the science thing. So, um, you know, in the early 1950s, when he's working for Hyman Rickover developing the nuclear Navy, which Colin Powell said, that's, what's won, that's what won the Cold War, is that our submarines could stay underwater for months on end. The Russians tried to build nuclear submarines and they kept blowing up and Rickover is the greatest admiral in American history. And, and there's a lot to make that argument, even though he was a complete son of a bitch. But, and, and he was a desk jockey, but, but the nuclear Navy was hugely important. And it was, they, had, they put a nuclear power plant on the back of a submarine before they built one on land, right? Before they had a nuclear power station. That's how cutting edge it was. And it was exciting to work on this as it was to work in the early days of the, the internet or something like that. But in 1952, there was a secret experimental reactor in Canada that went into meltdown. And, and the Canadians put out this, you know, highly classified APB to get anybody who knew anything about nuclear power. And so Rickover sent Carter up there with a team and they, figured that they could only stay in for 90 seconds. Each uh, pair of, of engineers could only stay in a 90 for 90 seconds. They built a mock-up on a tennis court of the reactor, which was flooded with radioactive water. And then they went in at great personal risk. And it turned out they got a thousand times more rads than uh, they had estimated. Uh, it's amazing that, uh, you know, he's lived as long as he has given given that exposure and that he was able to conceive Amy after that. He already had his three sons, but 
So there's all of these kinds of things that almost nobody knows about that happened in his life. Uh, and then just quickly on the women's thing, because I, I brought it up. So, you know, he appointed five times as many women to the federal bench as all of his predecessors combined, including Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who said that she was often asked, uh, when did you know you wanted to be a judge? And she said, when Jimmy Carter decided that half the human race had something to contribute. And he basically moved the whole federal government from tokenism to diversity. And that was, to my mind, like way down on his list of unheralded accomplishments. There were so many things that he got done that nobody noticed. We all yawned. I mean, I wasn't quite a full-time reporter yet. I was still in college for most of it, but I got there in 1980. I got to Washington as a, you know, sort of became a reporter. And there would be these, you know, bill signings like every couple of weeks and reporters couldn't be bothered. And when he put the solar panels on the roof of the White House, oh my God, what kind of a stunt is this? How boring is this? Who cares? You know, and, and so just to give you another example of an energy bill, I asked a really good reporter who, uh, one of the best, we were talking about Carter and like Sam Donaldson, all the rest, he said, you know, we, we were too hard on him. We didn't appreciate him enough and his contributions. But I said, have you ever heard of PURPA? And that was a bill signed when you were covering the White House. He goes, yeah, I vaguely, but I can't quite remember. I said, well, that was a bill that Carter initiated and signed that re-regulated public utilities so that they could use green energy. Maybe just like slightly relevant to the world that we live in now. You know, so Carter was a political failure, but a substantive success in many areas. And he, he was a, uh, a uh, I guess you could describe him maybe to go to your point about him being smaller than life. He was a visionary without being a, a leader. It sounds like a contradiction in terms, but he, he peer over the horizon. But then when he would try to march toward that horizon, there really wasn't, there really weren't very many people behind it. Well, he didn't have LBJ's skills too, to build, bend people's will. Or Reagan's skills, you know, as a communicator. I mean, I think the idea of him being a legislative failure just doesn't bear scrutiny because he got so much through. Our and friend, uh, John Dickerson, friend of politics and prose as well, talks about how presidents nowadays have to take blame for things that they were really outside of their control, just because that's what we expect of our president. And so much of your book seems to be things that hurt Jimmy Carter that were out of his control, including energy prices, Afghanistan, uh, perhaps even inflation, although we were joking before we came uh, into this room here that David Rubenstein gets a little bit of the credit for helping whip inflation now. Uh, <laughs> no. But how much of it were things out of his control? Yes, that's that's very true. Um, so he had really good luck in 1976 when he came out of nowhere. And then he had, he did okay in 1977, 78. He mismanaged the White House some, but his popularity was still pretty high, went much higher than Trump ever did. He go, went into the 70s at one point. And, you know, they did okay in the midterms. 79 and 1980 were pretty much a disaster. That section of the book is called Swamped. He was just swamped by events, uh, but inflation, you got to realize like oil prices went up 14 fold, not 14%, 14 fold in like a 15 year period. And, and, you know, OPEC was just a killer. And in terms of solving the inflation problem, it was not David, it was Paul Volcker. So Reagan gets the credit, right? So I, I interviewed Volcker not long before he died. And I, I, I did my interviews, Walter, in reverse actuarial order. So That's I got, right. I got to Brzezinski, I got to Volcker, I got to Harold Brown, who was the defense secretary, all shortly before they, they died. And, you know, Volcker, who had become a real admirer of Jimmy Carter, um, said that uh, he went up to him when they were on a fishing trip, a big fishing trip together after he left office and said, you know, I'm sorry if I cost you uh, the presidency. And Carter rightly smiled and said, you know, there were a lot of factors, Paul, like, don't worry about it. But he was a really big one. And I would argue that the, the single biggest, because he jacked up interest rates at one point to 19%. Can you imagine? Hard to believe. I saw Bob Carey 
uh, the former senator from Nebraska, governor of Nebraska, and he thought that Carter pardoning the draft dodgers at the beginning of his presidency was one of the most courageous, best things an American president has ever done to bring closure to the Vietnam War. And he said, but I voted for Reagan. I said, why? He said, I was running restaurants in Omaha and you know I was highly leveraged. And you know, interest rates were 15% in the fall of 1980. And I, I was suffocating. Um, and the reason they were was because of Volcker. So I argue that Volcker elected Reagan and then he reelected him because his harsh medicine worked. Inflation came down. We had that boom in 84 and Reagan was easily reelected and he didn't fix the economy. It, it was Volcker. There's a lot of questions in the Q&A thing. So I'm going to go to them, even though I have a few more. There's one from Cam Reef, but it's also uh, Christina Cherak also asked, um, have the Carters read any of your book? Have they had any reaction? Um, so uh, Jimmy Carter had a fall uh, late last year. And some of you might have seen him uh, with a lot of bruises on his face at Habitat. And he didn't know it when that picture was taken, but he'd suffered a subdural hematoma. And he had to have a procedure. And after the fluid was drained from his brain, he hasn't been able to see. So I can't email with him anymore. And he's listening to the book. And the audio book uh, is very well read by an actor named Michael Boatman. And he is partway through the book. Rosalind is reading it. And they're very happy that I did it because, you know, as a lot of the people around him say, finally, about time. Uh, and they like a lot of it, but not all of it. <laughs> And Good. that's kind of the way I want it. You know, they, they object to certain things. I'm just to give you an example. You know, he ran a kind of a dog whistle campaign for governor of Georgia in 1970. And he didn't say anything racist, but he went and curried favor from, uh, from racists. Uh, and, and then uh, it's a very dramatic story. A minute after he takes the oath, he says, the time for racial discrimination is over. And the uh, white state senators, I found out his old colleagues from the state Senate, they walked out. They, were, they felt he had betrayed them. Uh, and uh, the black Georgians who were there you know, said, he said, what? Like they couldn't believe that he said this. And then he went on to be a progressive governor of Georgia and that put him, he became, he went on the cover of Time Magazine as the new face of the South, and and you know that helped him uh, become president. In 1970, around then, there was an inflection point in the South, having grown up in the South, which uh, is where the populists uh, split. There was finally a divide between the populists who would play the race card and the populists who didn't. And even in Louisiana, we had Huey Long, who did not, and Earl Long did not play the race card. Jimmy Carter, when he gets in the office, does. George Wallace, famously, Orville Faubus, many of the other Southern populists decided it's a way to go. I was wondering what caused Jimmy Carter to decide? Uh, was it the background in Plains or was it just the morality in his soul that caused him not to play the race card? So Carl Sanders, who was his opponent in 1970, accused him of playing the race card. And you could argue that even though he didn't say anything explicitly racist, and he, you know, he became, he, he had not met, not ever met Martin Luther King the whole time he was in the state Senate. But he did in that, toward the end of that campaign, Daddy King, who had been for Sanders, he established this very important relationship with Daddy King. And then he he knows that he can't run again at that time under state law. So he knows that he's, he can't run again and he would lose if he could. So he has some political interest in, in being a progressive enlightened governor on race, but it really does come from his uh, extraordinarily interesting childhood. Um, and he, um, his father was a white supremacist his, uh, he tried to be a nice white supremacist, if you can believe that, but he was. Uh, his, uh, his mother um, was a liberal compared to everybody else. So she was the only person in the whole county who had anything 
nice to say about Abraham Lincoln, but she wasn't what we would define as a liberal. She was against intermarriage, for instance. Uh, and, um, but she took them to black churches and she was a nurse and she treated black patients for free. And his whole emphasis on global health comes out of that relationship with his mother. But she was in many ways an absent parent. And after she died, Carter said that he was really in many ways raised by an illiterate black woman farmhand, one of the best cotton pickers in the whole county named Rachel Clark. And uh, he wept at Rachel Clark's grave. Uh, and um, she introduced him to a lot of his spiritual ideas and his love of nature. And he became really the greatest environmental president since Theodore Roosevelt, which we can talk about. But so he, he leaves for the Navy, he already has this kind of moral foundation. And in the Navy, the first black midshipman shows up, he's a couple of years behind Carter. And Carter is from the South, but he protects him. And he's called an end lover by the other midshipmen. And then uh, the same thing when he's on board the submarine. So we know where his heart is, but then for 18 years, when he returns to Plains after his father dies, and he's building a business and there's white terrorism all around him. And the, the Klan is there and it's really heavy duty stuff in Sumter County, Georgia. And the, the sheriff is described by Martin Luther King as the meanest man in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, Carter ducks, he ducks the civil rights movement. He pop his head up once in a while to, you know, try to integrate the, not really fully integrate the church, but just allow black blacks to cross the threshold of the church as visitors. And there's a resolution that he loses on that deacons prevent even that. That's, that's where we were and, and at that time. And so he has to worry about his business because uh, there's this interracial farm nearby. And um, it, it, the people in the area hate it so much they have a boycott. Carter observes the boycott. He won't sell to this interracial farm, but one of his competitors does his place is dynamited. So he had reasons that related to his business, why it just wasn't plausible for him to be in the civil rights movement. And he said, I could have either been in politics and, and business or be in the civil rights movement, but not both. And so that was the choice that he felt he had to make. But when he becomes uh, elected and does become friends with Daddy King and everything yes. else, is that political expediency or is that who he was? No, I think that's who he was. But it had the advantage of also helping to set him up as, as a, a presidential candidate. New South. I mean, he doesn't get on the cover yeah. of time if he yeah. doesn't do that. Right. But, he, but it was not just political calculation. In fact, Charles Kerbo, who uh, Remember him? was his top advisor and you know, wise sage for him, he strongly advised him not to say that in his inaugural address. He was urged to do it by his very eccentric Jewish pilot, Cessna pilot. And there's a whole story behind uh, why he, he said time for racial discrimination is over. It doesn't sound like much now, but it was, it was huge at the time. And, and, uh, but it really does reflect who he is. And I think, I think his guilt over not having spoken up all that time helped to power that and his faith have powered these amazing achievements, you know, uh, uh, um, globally. I mean, they named children after him in Africa now. He's a right. true global icon. Especially well, he never would have been, been the national figure had he not changed and become embraced civil rights, which leads to a question Dom Stevens from the UK has in the chat room. It's actually about both of us, but since this is your night, I'll just make it about you. He says that we have an incredible gift of creating dramatic narratives out of historical details, but do you get the sense that your subjects had an eye on how the narratives of their biographies will go as they're li living their lives and they made their decisions accordingly. In other words, live their lives with the assumption that books would be written about them. Uh, in Carter's case, not until he started running for president and he, when he was a kid, he, all he wanted to do was be, go to the Naval Academy. And then later he wanted to be an Admiral and Chief of Naval Operations. So he was not one of these guys like more like Joe Biden who always knew they wanted to be president. By the way, Biden was the first Senator to endorse uh, Carter and he stuck with them when Ted Kennedy challenged him. Um, but so I think around the time 
he's starting to run for president, which is really early. He, he won in 76, but by late 72, he's already, you know, really planning on, on his campaign. And he wrote a little campaign autobiography called Why Not the Best, which grew out of this question that Admiral Rickover had asked him in his crazy interview. You know, Rickover was the hardest interviewer ever. He'd tell you to go open the window and it was nailed shut. He wanted to see your reaction or he'd tell you to call your girlfriend and, and break it off so that you could join him. And if you did that, you were out, you know, cause you were too suggestible. Uh, and he, with Carter, he asked him where he stood in his class at the Naval Academy. And he said, uh, I, I was 59th out of a class of 850. And Rickover said, did you do your best? And Carter said, not always. And Rickover said, why not your best? And that was the end of the interview. And he got in, but then when he wrote this autobiography, he tried to shape this narrative as, as the questioner suggests with that, that book in, in 1974, 75. And a lot of what I had to do was peel back that myth-making. Like I remember at one point I saw Robert Caro, who, you know, you and I both know in, in New York and he, uh, I mean, his first question was always, why only one volume? You know, because <laughs> uh, my publisher only wants one volume. But then, uh, you know, uh, he said he would talk about how he had to peel back all the lies that Lyndon Johnson told about his childhood. And that took him many years to do. And, and Carter didn't lie about his childhood, but he sugarcoated it. And so I had a lot of work to do to figure out, you know, the 10% that wasn't quite true, but I didn't know which 10% it was. And that took, that took a lot of time to peel back his, his mythologizing of himself. Well, just to give real quickly my answer, the one character I wrote about who knew his life was a narrative that he was writing was Ben Franklin. Uh -huh. Even as a 16 year old, 17 year old rolling the yeah. uh, paper along the streets of uh, Philadelphia to show how industrious he was, he was always writing his autobiography and assuming people would be writing biographies about him. Uh, Rich Ramsey asked if the hostage situation worked, would Carter have been reelected? Uh, Carter thinks so. He thinks if he just had one more helicopter in April of 1980, when they, uh, you know, they had this disaster in the desert at Desert One and uh, that uh, they would have rescued the hostages and he would have been reelected. First of all, I don't think that they, um, uh, I think the mission was kind of a Rube Goldberg contraption and it, I don't think it would have worked. And uh, I, I kind of walked through what the plan was. It wasn't really that plausible. Um, so I, I don't think it would have worked even if they had gotten to Tehran. And if his negotiations in the fall of 1980, which I go through all the October surprise business, not at great length, because that was a rabbit hole I didn't want to go too deeply into. But there's there's a new document that came out that suggested that the Reagan people really might have uh, cut a deal with the Iranians to not release the hostages until after the election. But even if Carter had gotten them out, I don't think he would have won. Reagan was a much better candidate and the economy was in such bad shape that when Reagan turned to uh, the audience in their only debate and said, are you better off than you were four years ago? People just weren't economically better off. And, and the Carter people say that the fact that election day was literally the one year anniversary mm -hmm. of the seizure of the hostages, November 4th, 1979, they were seized. November 4th, 1980 was election day, and that the news magazines, the television networks, which were much more central to presidential politics then, they all did their one year anniversary pieces on the cover with the, you know, the hostage with the blindfold on, and it reminded everybody of Carter's impotence in getting them out. And they think that's what cost them the election. I think it's a kind of a multi causal. And Carter, even though he was humiliated by Reagan when they, by the Iranians, when they released them one minute after Reagan took office, he was so happy that they came home alive because peace was always preeminent for him. And that the way I want to ask people to put more questions in the Q&A, but we do have one from Zachary Kittree. 
uh, that follows just what you were saying just now. So I'll let you continue, which was, was 1980 then with the Iranians, really the first time a US election was targeted and hijacked by a foreign power. It seems so apparent now that the actions of Iran were literally delivered the presidency to Reagan and may have been designed to do so. Well, first of all, we don't have rock solid proof of this. So Gary Sick, who was Carter's advisor on Iran in the White House, wrote a book about the October surprise. And I spent a lot of time with Gary and, and you know, it falls just short. It may be because William Casey's people were able to destroy the evidence. A lot of it came down. There were many bogus theories, like that George H.W. Bush, who was the vice presidential candidate, went to Paris in the middle of the campaign. That's ridiculous. I mean, he had an airtight alibi and it just didn't, I'm convinced that simply didn't happen. So I had to sort through a lot of the bogus things, but there was one part of it that a lot of it turned on. And that was whether William Casey, who later became head of the CIA and was Reagan's campaign manager, left a conference in London, a history conference, to fly to Madrid. And a lot of the people debunking the October surprise uh, theories, they'd always try to prove that Casey was never in Madrid. So none of this could have happened. Casey was never in Madrid. Well, it turned out just a few years ago, a reporter named Robert Perry, who since died, found a cable in the Bush library uh, of the station, uh, the ambassador to uh, Spain cabling the uh, cabling back Bill Casey in town today. We don't know why. We don't know what he's here for. And but the hotel records that would have nailed it down, much less the accounts of the meeting itself, were, were more elusive. So the evidence is suggestive, but but not. Uh, we can't conclude for sure that it happened. And and it may have also happened in 1968, where the Nixon campaign conspired with. Uh, the South Vietnamese government to delay a uh, peace deal in uh, in Vietnam in order to help him beat Hubert Humphrey that year. Yeah, I was thinking of the uh, 68 uh, example. Yeah. David uh, Septoff says presidents have been hampered by lack of relationships with Congress. And especially, you know, Democrats, you have LBJ, who the master of the Senate, as your friend Caro says, right. but most of them, including Bill Clinton, Jimmy Carter, whatever, don't have a feel for the Hill. Uh, tell me about Carter. Uh, you say he passed much more legislation than we give him credit for, but he didn't really have a feel for Capitol Hill, did he? No, he did not. And his people did not return phone calls. Uh, and he blew that part of the presidency. When I asked him, like, what... Um, you know, what are your regrets? It was that he didn't uh, handle himself better as leader of the Democratic Party. And he had a better relationship with Tip O'Neill than Myth would have it. But Tip, uh, who thought he was the smartest president he ever met, and, um, you know, said that he just wasn't very shrewd politically. And Rosalind, everybody knew that she was much sharper politically than her husband. Um, and he would, he would think as an engineer, I have this chapter called Inner Engineer, you know, that if he got to the right answer, that would then carry the day, the logic of the answer to the policy. <clears throat> and it's the same reason that engineers, as brilliant as they can be, often fall just short of being CEO in a company because they're, they're missing a certain kind of emotional intelligence that, really, that you really need. Uh, and that did hamper him and it hurt him, for instance, on, um, on tax reform. You know, he had a very ambitious tax reform plan, but he didn't check it with uh, Russell Long, uh, the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, and Al Ullman, chairman of Ways and Means Committee in the House, to kind of grease the skid so that he could come up with something that he, he liked. And instead, he, he tried to too often prove that he was the smartest guy in the room. His big failure was with Ted Kennedy. He did not manage that relationship. And as a result, we could have had a, a healthcare bill that was good, but there was enough blame to go around. At one point, Carter did get support from all the key committee chairmen for his version 
of health care reform, and Kennedy torpedoed it out of peak. And, and so, as I said, you know, they, they both messed up, and it really hurt the country because there's another 35 years. Carter's plan was very similar to Obama, what became Obamacare. On the other hand, getting the Panama Canal treaties through Congress was an unbelievable legislative accomplishment. Two thirds of the country's against it. Reagan is making his bones as a politician by denouncing it, and it requires two thirds of the Senate to get through. So with the help of Howard Baker, and he reached out to Republicans, and Carter ran this really effective lobbying campaign to get the, the treaties approved, and they prevented a war in Central America. The J, J Joint Chiefs said that we would have needed 100,000 troops there in perpetuity. Right. We, they would be there now uh, if, if those uh, treaties had not been approved. You know, you mentioned the mom and gum. Listening to you talk about how he was had a mind that felt he could get to the right place analytically, and so therefore didn't feel you had to stroke and stoke relationships. And it reminds me, I wonder if it reminds you, which is the question that somebody else you wrote about, which is Barack Obama. Yeah. His book, by the way, since we, he needs a little bit of help touting his book, <laughs> will be available next Tuesday at Politics and Prose. Right. So um, I think that I have a chapter in, I, I wrote two books about Obama, and I have a chapter in one of them called Missing the Schmooze Gene. And, you know, Obama liked to play golf with, you know, young aides in the White House. He, he, his idea of a bad, you know, afternoon, unrelaxing afternoon was to play golf with a congressman. It's, Carter felt the same way. Uh, you know, his idea of hell was to spend time with members of Congress. And in that sense, neither of them were doing their job uh, in, in, that, in that dimension. It, it's, it's their job to do that, e even if they consider these guys insufferable. Um, that was Bloomberg's great uh, put down of Barack Obama is he likes to play golf with his staff. Yeah. And it was it was a fair shot. And I, you know, I'm, I'm a, an admirer of Obama and I have a lot of very positive things to say about him. But, you know, both of them could have gotten more done if they didn't have this kind of slightly superior attitude toward the the nitty gritty of politics they're dealing with politicians and they don't like to feel like they're being condescended to by intellectual presidents. Uh, Steve, Miller asked a, Steve Miller asked a question about another titan of the Senate that uh, Carter had an interesting relationship with, but that's Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Yeah. Uh, Moynihan didn't suffer fools, says uh, Steve Miller. What was his impression of Carter and vice versa? So really interesting. So, um, uh, Moynihan uh, was elected the same year Carter was elected to the Senate, 1976, and super independent, as we know, throughout his entire career. So he was never a reliable Carter vote, and he he actually supported Kennedy in 1980, but he wasn't uh, an antagonist toward Carter, and he, he approved of certain things he did and not of other things. Uh, then, and this really interested me, so after um, Carter is uh, president, uh, in 1994, he makes peace in both North Korea and in Haiti. Um, and um, he, but he, he did it, the reason that I say that his presidency is underrated and his post-presidency is a little overrated is he didn't have the power as a the levers of power as a former president. And he also let his ego get in the way a little bit sometimes. So in both cases, he went on CNN before reporting to Clinton. And the Clinton people, President Clinton and his people were enraged by this. And there were serious words exchanged. And there was a lot of terrible press about Carter, even though he prevented war, two wars, because he was doing these kind of ego turns. And Moynihan uh, said that he deserved like three Nobel Prizes for this. Like he saw all right through, and this was in the period when they were not going to give Carter a Nobel Peace Prize. It wasn't until years later that he finally got it. And Moynihan would see through all the noise to what is the guy actually doing. And so when Carter would fail on something, Moynihan would be merciless about his failure. And when he succeeded, he would be 
uh, he'd go against the the prevailing wisdom and say, you know what, you really got something done in that case. Sa the same thing happened on uh, uh, ca after Camp David, like Averill Harriman, who you wrote about in The Wise Men. He said, you know, this is one of the greatest achievements an American president has ever brought up. It, it's at the very top of all presidential achievements in American history. And then like two years later, he wants to get rid of Carter, you know? And that, uh, so it, that leads us right into our <laughs> last question from Taylor Holland, which yeah. is um, hearing what you've been saying on all that. Do you believe that over time, the US will grow to appreciate Carter's presidency? Uh, and, you know, perhaps we judge people by the problems we're facing. So maybe in the era of Trump, he becomes just what you do for him, what McCullough did for Truman. Well, I, I'm hoping that that's the way it goes. Look, he does not belong on Mount Rushmore. He was not a great president, but he was a very consequential president. And if he'd been reelected, the 1980 campaign takes on tragic dimensions because shortly before he left office, he got a report from the Council on Environmental Quality, which was his White House office on the environment. Remember, he had just become the greatest conservationist president since Theodore Roosevelt, doubling the size of the National Park Service by protecting 105 million acres in, in uh, Alaska, he protected the redwoods in California, a long first fuel economy standards, like all of these unbelievable environmental achievements, which were not recognized at the time because the press judges you on your political success. And as we've discussed, he was a political failure. So it's up to the historians to come back and look at the substance to see what he achieved. And at the end of 1980, beginning of 1981, he gets this report from the Council on Environmental Quality about this problem they called carbon dioxide pollution. It was only in the scientific community that this was being discussed. Carter had first identified global warming in the journal Nature. I found he had underlined when he was governor in 1971. Other guys played golf. He read scientific journals, right? He's underlining this article uh, in the journal Nature. So this report is delivered to him. What does the report recommend and what does he sign off on? Precisely the standards in the Paris Climate Accord 35 years later. And if he had been reelected, he would have done the same thing with climate change they did with every other recommendation he got on the environment. He would have begun implementing it and we would have been addressing climate change in the early 1980s. And so even though you know he was a pro-coal president because he was trying to get us off Middle East oil, you know, so he wouldn't have like gotten off fossil fuel overnight. You know, he did sin fuels, he did fossil fuel things, but he would have put things in place to reduce our dependency on, uh, on fossil fuel that were in line with the fuel economy standards and putting the solar panels on the roof of the White House, which is where my book starts. And, and so, you know, I, I, in answer to the question, I think he will pretty quickly now ascend in the estimation of uh, not just me, but of, of all fair-minded historians. Well, if that happens, it'll largely be because of this book. John, thank you so much for joining us. And Bradley, thank you for having us. Thanks, Walter. Walter, great uh, moderating as usual. And, uh, and Jonathan, uh, congratulations again on, uh, on really an authoritative, instructive, and revealing book that that uh, transforms our, our appreciation of Jimmy Carter and his remarkable influential life. Uh, to everyone watching, uh, a reminder that you can find a link in the chat column uh, to Jonathan's book, His Very Best. Uh, thanks to all of you for tuning in from us here at Politics and Pro.